Stop the recording. Okay, we're good. <laughs> That's a new thing where they say that. Ooh. Like, I feel like, like it so it can be used against you in a court of law. I oh, feel like there's um, enough weird things that have happened. Yeah. Fabulous. All right. Well, this is what I want to make sure that you know. Um, today we're talking about triads, trios, threesomes. <laughs> but the funny thing is, yeah. no, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> the funny thing about words, you know, and whenever you're trying to learn anything, and Donna is so good at teaching things, and so I love her take on things so many times. When I first heard of, you know, triads, mix, I thought of mixing triads. I'm like, okay, mixing three colors together. Or you think of that, you know, red, yellow, blue, you know, or, it's, you know, CMYK. <laughs> but you think about, you know, three colors and how they mix together. But that's not the only thing that, you know, triad means. And, and actually talking about triads, it, you know, there's so many things like that. Words like hue mean one thing and another thing. And so I find it interesting because when people are talking, I'm sitting there, you know, sometimes trying to discern what do they mean? Because they could mean this or they could mean that. So I want to help you know, de demystify some of this, but also try to be really clear. So the word triad can refer to a mixing triad, which is mixing three colors together, you know, and seeing what you get out of that. And, you know, like I said, a good example is like primary cyan, magenta, and yellow. That's a mixing triad, for example. And um, we're so familiar with that because that's what our inkjet printers do. They mix that and black to make all of these beautiful colors. Um, but then you have something called the triadic color harmony. And that's groups of three colors. And these are evenly spaced from each other on that you know, color wheel that we're all familiar with. And this arrangement, it tends to have very vibrant contrast. Not as vibrant as like a complementary contrast, but it's vibrant. And, and so it works best if you let one color be more dominant than the other two. And so if there's one thing and I can impart today as we move through this, always just think it's not about, you know, everything is the same amount, gallon, gallon, gallon. What is that saying, Donna? I've always heard it and I've never like <laughs> taken it in, but it's like pint quart ounce, something like that, <laughs> you know, but it's just like a little bit of this, a, you know, a little bit more of that. And then a whole bunch of this one. And it just helps things to you know, work better together. So you're not talking about equal amounts of all three colors in a composition because then you're, I won't know where to rest. <laughs> One so. of the things that I used to have in my classroom was um, if you remember when your babies would play with those rings and they'd stack them on top and the top one would get really small on the bottom donut would be bigger. That's how I used to describe color and like even describe how much you should be using in values as well. So whenever you're using color, I always, I used to just sit on the table and people were like, why do you have this play school toy here? And I'm like, cause that's how you should be painting. I'm gonna grab something. My eyeglasses are dirty and it's making me nuts. <laughs> you keep fuzzing in and out. That is such a great analogy. I really like that. I, I would love to see you do that in a, online one of these times to describe it to people well because that's what a great visual i think everyone gets that okay <laughs> i can see <laughs> so when i'm talking about um mixing trads i'm going to pull up a few examples to kind of show you what they are and what i mean um so first we'll start here this is perfect and i will show my screen Share screen. Okay. All right, can everybody see that okay? So this is a basic color wheel. And this has just got, you know, a Ben's yellow light, Quinn magenta and phthalo blue and I've mixed all of the colors around it. And I kind of cleaned it up digitally so you could see it better. Um, a lot of my things are in the Connecticut studio because we're, we're gonna be renovating and they're taking sledgehammers to this place, so I don't have a lot of my visuals here. <laughs> Getting in a car and going home so I don't have to be around when they smash things. So this is a basic color wheel. And like this is like for me, when I when I really want pure colors, I tend to migrate to this set of three: Benzillo Light, Quin Magenta, and Phthalo Blue Green Shade. Um, 
I just like the combination that I can get out of it. So in the other colors that you see around the wheel are mixed by mixing, you know, those primary colors. So everything in between phthalo blue and ends yellow was mixed using those colors. And I usually try when I'm working with a triad to, you know, sit there and really sit there and mix just little drops of it together so I can figure out what's the middle place between these two colors. Because I can tell you what it's not. It's not equal amounts of this paint and equal amounts of that paint to make the mid-tone. You know, some paints are going to be stronger than others and have what we call a higher tinting strength. So a phthalo blue will take over the world. <laughs> so you just want to add a little, you know, just like have a drop of it and start adding the yellow in and see where it goes. So you can figure out them. Um, so you're not adding pounds of yellow into the phthalo blue to change it, basically. So it's something to play around with, but never think equal amount of paints equals that mid-tone color. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's true with a lot of colors. And that's why we've talked in the past about tinting strength. Some colors are just stronger than others. Well, the quins and the phthalos tend to be really super strong colors. And so just adding a little bit and trying to figure out what's the middle between these two colors. And you can sit there with a, you know, putting a drop in of each one and kind of figure that out. And that's how you create this wonderful palette of colors from simply three. <laughs> so that's the start with what we call the hue palette. So it's like, these are all the hues. These are mixed purely together, no white, no black, um, just with each other and kind of next to each other. So from there, as we've said before, and I'm just gonna go review this because I know sometimes we don't have the same people in these sessions. So I do sometimes a little go back to cover things from there. Uh, can you mute everybody? Oh, I thought I had. Let me do that again. Let me try to do that again. <laughs> it's hard to do it in this view. It's because it's giving me a little piece of people, but I'll see if I see anything popping out. But so far, so good. Okay. Okay. Maybe it's you then. I don't know. There's like a weird feedback. Hmm. That's good. You're all good now. Okay. Hopefully that's all right. Um, so the hue wheel, you know, starts off, everything's kind of vibrant and, you know, just the pure pigments together. And then when you start adding in white, just to review, that's what we call tinting. So tinting a color means adding a little bit of white to it. And that's where you get those, you know, paler tones and more opaque because white is more opaque, unless you're using zinc white, <laughs> which is very transparent. So, or translucent. So that's how we get tints. Same wheel, just adding white to the colors. And if you do the same thing and then go add, um, let me go to this one, add black to the colors, that's how you get, you know, that wonderful shades and the dark colors. So from that one wheel, you really have a huge variety of color. And then there's one more place where I tend to sometimes put in N5, which is the neutral gray, the mid-tone of all the neutral grays. And that's how you can get tones. You get kind of, as you see, as it goes in towards the center of the wheel, they become a little more gray and more desaturated. So you can do a lot with very little. Now this was all starting off with some really vibrant colors and you know what people would commonly expect in a discussion about a color wheel. But I wanna show you another visual here. In this uh, version, I have taken a different set of whatever I decided to use as the primary three triad. And you can see the huge range of color possibilities just by changing a yellow or changing you know, what we call the yellow or the blue position and the red position of that trio. So you can get a very huge mix. But what's nice about triads when you're mixing with just three colors to start is that you're going to be amazed by how well these colors, they all go together. They all work together because they all have the same mother colors as Donna likes to call it. They've all started from the same place. And so there's nothing jarringly out of place in your composition at all. It all looks like it belongs together in a scene. I think of it like, you know, 
living being here down in Florida part of the year, um, people come down in the middle of fall. I'm wearing fall colors. They may be light clothes, but I'm wearing like fall colors and people come down and they're tropical and I'm like, it's out of place, <laughs> but it's not, it's part of the environment, but you want things to kind of fit together unless you're trying to really call attention to something. And a good way of doing that is by using a mixing triad so you can create that. This kind of mixing triad, as I said before, is when they're equally spaced apart on the color wheel. And that is, in this case, what I've been showing you has been equal pretty much in every respect. Equal in their value and equally spaced on the wheel itself. <clears throat> and that's why all of these look, you know, there's nothing out jumping out as being really light versus, you know, really dark. They're all right kind of there in that, what I call the five land, right in the middle of the value. Um, so it's interesting as, a, as to how much black is in there. So that is the most pure mixing triad. Um, from there, I wanna take you, I wanna discuss just a few things that we've discussed before. And one of those, I'm gonna just harp on it for a second, is about color temperature. Um, when you're trying to mix colors, you'll notice that it's difficult, you know, to get a really great purple in the same place that you're going to get really great oranges. It's just, it's difficult to do when you're doing this mixing. You'll see some of these have just fantastic oranges, but the purples are god awful. <laughs> and that's because of the difference between cool and warm colors when you're doing the mixing. So the first thing I tell people is when you're doing a mixing triad, you're trying to create this limited palette for yourself of three colors. The first thing to do is perhaps stick with things that are single pigment only. And that means they've only got one ingredient in that paint. I mean, ingredient, they've got, it's got polymer and stuff, but one pigment. So you know what you're dealing with. Because if you're mixing with a color that is made up of green and blue or green and yellow or green and red, to literally, to make that color, and then you try to mix it and it's doing all kinds of weird things, and you're like, why is it doing that? It's because of all those other ingredients. So like permanent violet dark, for example, is one of my favorite colors. And it's very hard to find right now because one of its core components, there's a color called anthroquinone or indenthrene blue, uh, pigment PB60 is, has been constrained for a year. And so you're going to see less and less and less and less of that on the shelves. If you find it on Amazon, I'd be shocked right now. <laughs> it's just hard to find. And if you have that, it was funny because even as honest as I'm a geek and even in geek land with the, you know, all the golden associates, when they were telling us, you know, back in June 20 of 2020, when they said this is constrained, you know, it may cause some issues. We'll let you know. And then just, Monday of this week, they discontinued temporarily until things are resolved via anthroquinone blue and two colors made with it, permanent violet dark and hooker's green. Love that color. <laughs> and so those are discontinued for now because they can't get the pigment. And so all of these things that people talk about, you know, not being able to get, you know, lumber and this and that, it is affecting the paint industry as well. So just know if you have anthroquinone you know, we can give you the recipes to make everything else. But yeah, it's, it's a strange world right now. But not, not, not to divert too much onto that. No, understanding what your paints are made of. So you're working with single pigment paints. And I have a list that's gonna go, Donna will have up on her uh, Patreon, there it is. So I've just made a list of all of the single pigment paints that Golden makes and you know what their transparencies are and what the actual pigments are so you so you can become more familiar with those codes okay so P pb60 is pigment blue 60 literally and that's just it's it's what every single paint manufacturer knows that pigment as so right there you can see it and you can see it's light fastest and all the things you might want to know about it but these are great building blocks for a mixing triad. So that Donna- Are you sharing something? Cause I can't see it on the screen. Are you sharing a list or anything? Oh, how weird. Let me see. I, you know what I think it is? I need to share my entire screen. I tend to click around and then you guys don't see what the heck I'm doing. 
excuse me for being goofy. Because Donna forever and ever and ever. There you go. <laughs> okay, so this is what I was talking about. And I will be sharing this with Donna and she, she can put it on her Patreon, but it's all of the paints that Golden makes. And they do have the largest selection of heavy body acrylics of all of the manufacturers. So it's a very extensive list of all of the paints that are single pigment. Wonderful building yeah. blocks. Are these general scientific terms or are these golden? Like PB60, is that a golden number or is that a chemistry that is, number that is recognized? That is a recognized ASTM term, you know, and wh whoever does all the naming conventions, that is across every paint line, no matter if it's Sennelier or, you know, um, Liquitex, God help us, or, you know, Matisse, all of them, you know, will use the same if it's a paint that's actually using, you know, pigments versus dyes or whatever. Yes, they are a thousand percent labeled the same way and they all say what the pigments are used in that paint. And I'm so, just gonna, um, can I jump in real quick here? Like I'm going back to Payne's Gray, for example, I, Payne's Gray and every different brand of paint is a different color. So let's just say you have Payne's Gray and Liquitex. If you look at the, it's called ASTM, right? The 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 numeric like what? It's it's called the oh, I forget the name right now. It's like CIN. It's a it's the color information number or whatever. But it, it it's that ingredient, the pigment name. So if you look at Payne's Gray, I think it was like bone black and blue or something like that that made it but if you look at liquitex it could possibly be two totally different colors and that's why when you pick up paints gray it's not always the same color in other brands yeah that's why i'm showing on the screen right now i was i actually had a, a diagram i called what a pain <laughs> and yeah. this was just with watercolors because everything i'm telling you about pigment codes also goes with watercolors and as you can see, these three paints are, are marketing named Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray could mean anything to anyone. These three watercolor manufacturers, which is Daniel Smith, uh, Core, which is by Golden and Holbein, are you know, all different in their transparencies. <laughs> and look at the pigment information at the bottom. Completely across the board different for every one of them. So it may say Payne's Gray, but what does it mean? The pigment is gonna tell you what it what's really going on there so yeah it's a little nuts <laughs> so those goals are really valuable especially if you're trying to really get an understanding of the paint you have on hand you know because i think that i genuinely just thought Payne's gray should be Payne's gray should be Payne's gray because that name itself had a value and then after talking to you no it's actually just you know i thought Paint gray was a pigment. It's not. It's, it's just like, a name. It's like it literally. I call it a recipe because it's like how I make my buffalo chicken dip is probably different from how you make your buffalo chicken dip. They all taste like buffalo chicken dip, <laughs> but you know they're just slightly different. And that's exactly that's why these recipes are just so headache. Are you know they're different for every one of them. The result is similar, you know, and there's just slight variations in it but I mean that is true across oil paints acrylic paints you know any any pastels all of it it's how that manufacturer is taking that pigment and how much of it they're using how fine they're grinding it all kinds of different things that make them truly different and unique and it's and part of why have a number no pain's right? great just a name it's a marketing name you know, however, you know, when you see something that says quinacridone magenta, that's still, it may mean that it's pigment PV19, which I happen to know, but that doesn't mean, or I'm losing my brain, but that doesn't mean that someone else's isn't slightly different because of how much they use in it. Or if they have, they happen to have some of them, for example, maybe more red or more violet, depending on who the source is. Sometimes some pigments, there are up to 20 sources in the world. Some there are only four. Um, but yeah, paints can be very extremely varied. And so just starting with a mixing triad of single pigment paints, you're at least gonna know what you're working with. And so when you mix it with yellow and you go, why is that 
turning this color. You'll know if you understand your ingredients a little bit better. I think, I think it's kind of an important too, just in like, I, I get asked, you know, or have been asked before, like, why do you use Golden as opposed to other brands? And I believe that really my general state, I mean, I don't get paid by Golden. They've never given me a damn free product in their entire time in existence that I've been painting. But um, I feel like I, it's consistent. I can go back. I can depend on it. So I, the reason why I stick with Golden is I like their quality. I'm familiar with their quality. I've been doing it for long enough that I know what I'm going to get from the pigment. But now I'm understanding why. And it's, it's even more so than that. I mean, I know one of your favorite colors is probably cobalt teal, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> and when they couldn't find that pigment anymore that they used for that, you know, they, they knew that that was coming. So they came up with teal to try and fill that space. But it isn't like, if, if we were in a craft world, they wouldn't have said, oh, can't get that. And they would have just replaced it and slapped the same label on it and called it the same thing. Golden isn't that way. They're telling you exactly what's in it. Yes, it's different. And this is why. And then when they found a source for it again, they said, okay, now we have cobalt teal again. You know, it's slightly different, but it's closer to the original, but we're going to keep teal around because we like it too. But they're, yeah, they talk in pigment terms. So, they, you know, PG50, I believe, is that favorite color of Donna's. And, you know, sometimes in the paint industry, these things do get constrained. Um, paint for artists is not what drives it. It's the chemical industry and the coatings and, you know, car manufacturers of all things, you know, will grab that source and it won't be available for the, you know, fine art manufacturers to get. It's just, you know, we are low on the totem pole, sadly. <laughs> but... That's just the important thing to understand that the paint companies at that level, uh, that the level that we're talking about that are worth your dollars really do care about what's in their paint and that it's consistent so that any artist, if, I mean, when an artist starts using that paint in their work consistently, they should be able to get a tube of that paint anywhere, anytime, at, at any place. It says the same thing. It works exactly the same. And if it doesn't, believe me, we'll hear about it, right? Because it's supposed to be the same thing. All right, enough harping on that particular thing, but just know your, know your ingredients. And close that. Okay, so single pigments. I will give that handout to Donna. Another handout that I've done, shown you before, and that I will show again, or I'll, I'll probably upload again, is I've put together this, uh, there was a chart list of colors from Golden, where they literally listed all of their paints in warm to cool bias order. So you could see the colors that were considered warm versus the colors that were considered or cool versus warm. So that helps you mix. And that's where we were talking about mud earlier. Um, I don't want to dive too much into that, but it's something that we've talked about before. And I'll just show you. So when I'm talking about how the purples and this chart don't look so great, go back to this one. <clears throat> you know, when the purples here don't look so great, it's because I'm, I'm putting together a color that has yellow in it, like a warm red has yellow in it. And so that's neutralizing the color and making it muddier. Sometimes you want that. Sometimes these colors are great, but if you want clear mixes, that's why we do, I did this whole chart, which again, I will also upload again. Let me, can you, no, no, you probably can't see that. Let me bring it up. Maybe I'll just share multiple screens without sharing my whole darn screen. That would be nice. Okay. Oh, look, control click. Maybe I can do that. One moment, a little bit of window Olympics. Aha, now, can you see the big pie? Yes. Fabulous. So this is the clear mixing, The color it's the color mixing cheat sheet. It's basically so that you don't end up with muddy colors. Um, and so I've, I've literally listed, all of those are individual colors, yellows and blues and you know reds and blues and reds and yellows that work together to make non-muddy, really clear, mixes that aren't desaturated, that aren't more earth tony, you know, so you're getting what you want. So 
the colors around the edges are just the ingredients. I'm not showing you a mixed green, if that makes sense. It's yellows and blues. And if you mix those together in that pie slice, you're gonna get a beautiful green. So it lists all of the colors down at the bottom. Once again, Donna has this up on her, and we'll make sure it's up on the Patreon. But this is how you get really nice high intensity, as I call them, colors. So when you're mixing a color, um, when we're talking about bias and temperature, I know I'm going off here, but it's just all tied together. Um, when you're working with colors that are blues and reds to make a purple, you don't want either of those colors to have a warm bias because a warm bias in those colors means they have yellow in them. And when we talk about triads, if you mix yellow, red, and blue together, you get mud, brown or black. It just gives you, you know, all three colors together, that's what you get. So that's why you want to mix colors that don't have, for a purple, no yellow in them. If you want a beautiful green, you want no red in either color. So that means you want a cool yellow, okay? And a, a cool green or cool blue. And that makes that high intensity green. So no red in the color. And that's why this chart that I'm holding up, I, it shows you which from cool to warm or what the colors are and also that list. Same thing with a high intensity orange. You don't want any colors that have blue in them. So interestingly, no cool yellows, right? Because the cool yellows tend towards blue, where the warm yellows tend towards red. They have a red bias in them. And so that's why those yellows that you see up there in the orange pie slice are a little more orangey looking. <laughs> they just don't have blue in them. And the same thing with the reds. The reds are warm reds. And so they have yellow in them, not blue. So no blue. Yeah, I know it's a lot, but the, the, to, to get high intensity, not muddy colors, that's why you're going to make some different choices when you decide who's in your triad, and you'll see why things are going a little bit muddy based on what's in this pie chart. It'll help you do a better job of understanding what's going on when you're getting something that's not doing the best thing you like, like this one. <laughs> it's really I just a bunch really of love to ask the group because. I had none of the three colors. I didn't have primary magenta, cyan, or blue, right? Magenta, cyan, or yellow. I didn't have any of those in my stash. Did, did, does anybody here actually have those colors? Yeah, I, I like them. And it's funny because, I mean, most manufacturers say it's difficult to create that perfect cyan and magenta and yellow. But as you see in the upper left hand corner here, look how clean the mixes are. Mm. They're just they straddle, if you will, between warm and cool bias. And so they work well together, which is why your inkjet is able to create such beautiful colors, because it's not a warm or a cool. They're neutral and they work with everything. I almost feel like that's the question, the answer to the question of what three paint colors, you know, where should I start? I've never bought paint before. Where should I start? I you feel like, like a, you think just like yeah. a printer. Yeah, yeah, it's probably the smartest advice I never knew I needed. Yeah, you know, you know, I've harped on this before, but if I was to start from scratch, with the only things I needed, it would probably be CMY, so primary yellow, primary magenta, primary cyan. From there, I would definitely pick a black, but it would probably be bone black because it's transparent. And then, you know, titanium white and zinc white, so I could play around, and then probably neutral gray in you know the light range and the dark range. I I, I just go across that two, four, six, eight, kind of just so I could change the value of anything. And then I, I basically am now an inkjet printer <laughs> in my uh, ability. Yeah, so I mean, you start there. You know, it's, it's just an interesting place to start. And I think maybe we'd probably add one brown into the mix. Like a, I don't know, what, raw sienna, burnt umber. People had these colors in their, um, their stash. And I think it's just because they're not pretty, like, right? Like you go into the store and you're like, oh, this color, primary magenta, so pretty. It, it's not necessarily the one like quinacridone magenta, you know, or I need a really good yellow. You don't think primary yellow is a, 
fun color. But it does, oh, it's clean. I think that's I the other issue. I interchangeably do color. use the quinacridone magenta. I can't get over it. I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like going and buying color for color. Actually, this month's uh, color poll is a triad to pull out my book because it was absolutely, and I think it will be next week, the color poll result, result video will go live on Patreon. But I will tell you right now, this color triad is the grossest set of colors you all have ever wished upon me. <laughs> and um, it was cadmium yellow primer. And I had never used these colors before too. I'm gonna put this out there. Cadmium yellow primrose, cadmium red dark and azurite blue. And I, I got primary colors, right? Red, yellow, blue. How could this go wrong? It was absolutely wrong. And I'm sure there's something I'm supposed to learn from it. But like, I'm going to sh show you, this is the lesson that I did. It's not the worst thing ever. But, you know, when you're painting, you kind of want some joy. And <laughs> all I kept thinking was watermelon. Like there's a watermelon feel to like that area. And I'm like, for the love of God, I don't want to paint a watermelon just because the only thing I can see in that color palette is a watermelon. Um, but yeah, um, in choosing a triad, going to that red, yellow, blue, I'm going to be safe. You all are picking some cool colors. Cadmium yellow primrose. How can that be bad? And it was just the combination of those colors. So you need to tell me, because I didn't know when I actually referenced you in the video going, I'm going to need to have a talk with Sally Lynn. What do we have going on here? A warm and two cool? You've got a cool yellow. So it's a cool yellow that has blue in it. And so that's what's why your orange is, oh no. I'm looking. Yeah, definitely why that. So, and then the, what's the red? It's cadmium red dark. Pretty sure that one's, I, I'm gonna have to look this up, but I'm pretty sure that one's. And then Azurite Blue, which is not going to go into my top 10 list. And it's funny because that's one of my favorites. But it does not with that color. Definitely not with that color. <laughs> so it's it's just interesting, though. But that's that's the beauty of just be, you know taking a drop of each and starting to mix and doing like what you do. I have to say, when you sent me that, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I liked it because it was unexpected. They didn't work, you know, like what you always see. And that, that's kind of fun. It's what I, my eye is always looking for something. I think you've said it before, where someone can't go, oh, that's cadmium yellow primrose. <laughs> you know? And I, that's why I like the poll, because mm -hmm. I know that probably those colors were picked because they didn't know those colors either. I mean, they weren't in my bag of tricks. So I had to, you know, order them up and, and get them. And I was all excited. They're pretty colors. I got them in the mail. I put them out in and of themselves. They were pretty. And I started mixing and I'm like, for the love of God, what am I going to do on a creative page with watermelon? And it wasn't even like a pretty watermelon. Like it was like a watermelon that sat in the summer sun for too long. Well, and it's interesting. That's a great segue into what I was going to start showing next. Um, this is probably going to go pretty quickly today because I don't, I think, unless we have a lot of questions, I've got a lot of things to show you, but we're moving pretty quickly through this. Let's see. All right. I can't see my screen. Okay. So we talked about, okay, here we go. So when it comes to mixing triads, what you're talking about is you hated the mixing of it. But if you took those colors just kind of by themselves and just did the, the whiting, the toning, the shading, and the whatever with them and worked with them with kind of that, you know, one has more dominance than the others, I think you might be excited about it. I know a lot of artists say, oh, I don't use the color straight from the two, but that's not, I mean, literally we can take a color and modify it in so many ways and it still looks different than what comes out in the tube. But I love to use literally straight up with, you know, just modifying by when I'm mixing them on the palette, you know, basically or on my painting, I have taken pretty much every color that Golden makes and made little triads for myself that I reference every now and then when I'm stuck in a rut. And so I don't know if you can see my, these little circles now, here. Genius, but they do need a little bit of like clarity of like what what is what am I looking at? They're pretty, and I'd love this as a sticker to put somewhere on my suitcase. 
but like what because I think they're brilliant the way your mind works is is so beautiful in what it's you've weird. done here it's weird it's basically the concept is taking the colors and breaking them into that um color circle that you know who is it Joseph Albers created you know taking that basic color wheel and I broke out the golden paints into that wheel and then from there, I started saying, okay, let me take colors that are equally spaced apart and try to use them together, you know, based on what is available from golden. So that's why you see some areas like the, you know, aren't quite as many choices as others. Cause I was working, for example, in one value. So that's why, you know, here what I've got, uh, diorite, I can't say it, diorite yellow, you know, with a medium magenta and a light green blue shade, those are all kind of the same, you know, strength. They're, you know, one isn't more pastel than the other one. One isn't really lighter than the other. They're all kind of equal. And so that's this one right here. Um, see how everyone's on the outer ring? So they're kind of all equal. Um, whereas, and the same thing with this one, where everyone's kind of a light color, you know, that I was working with. And I was just trying to see how those would work together. And maybe if I use one more than the other to get you know, a little bit more punch out of that color and see how it works with the other colors. But sometimes I work with them equally spaced apart on the color wheel. And sometimes I even combine them in what I call a compound color wheel. So you know, in this case, these two colors are both on the same spoke but it was just fun to kind of work with both of them. Um, let me find someone who's more obvious. Uh, let's see, like this is medium magenta. And so I, I would use like more of it in the piece with my flowers or whatever, but then I like to bring in something like a Naples yellow hue for the yellow, for example. I thought that was a really fun con you know, contrast. And then the light ultramarine blue. And so, these are, once again, they're kind of in the same place as far as their value or their strength or whatever. But as I go through these, let me see, find some that kind of break the rules. Ah, see here we have some where it's not really quite evenly spaced apart, but I just like how they worked. So I don't like rules. <laughs> and so for me, I'm just looking for something to occupy that basic concept of red, yellow, and blue. So if I happen to be working with a light phthalo blue and a light magenta and then like a Naples yellow or a raw sienna, to me, the raw sienna and the Naples, Naples yellow fill that yellow space, even though they're not out here in this like brighter area that would have been equally spaced apart. So it's just fun to kind of play around with who is the red, green, and blue or red, yellow, and blue in that mix and get completely different results with every time you're doing it. Um, so that's really, that's just my, my thing for you today. It's part, part of it is working with single pigment colors, understanding their bias and temperature. So if, if you're getting weird purples, you know why, you know, and, and just, you know, playing around with those three colors. In this case, it's a color harmony. I'm not necessarily mixing them. I'm kind of making one or more colors come forward more than the other. That's how I do it with harmonies. I hope that makes some sense. How am I doing, Donna? No, I, I think it's a lot. I think it's visually super, like, I don't know what I'm looking at, but really the general gist is find that triad, red, yellow, green, and red, yellow, blue, but you can play around with it. It could be red, green, yellow, blue, you know, just in choosing a color palette yes you can make a monochromatic and all that kind of stuff but if you really want to kind of stretch across um the color the color rainbow i guess and make something that might be a little shifted that's where these triads come into play and i like this one that you have here too it's turquoise purple and like a yellow orange it's yes. still a play on that red yellow blue it's still a play but it's like cobalt teal and uh, I believe it's raw sienna and light, um, light violet. You know, the light violet is playing like the red part of it. So it's <laughs> super fun to play with. 
And I would actually say a fun little thing, like if you're in your space and you've got, let's just say you have 35 tubes of space, I would kind of put them together in a list and be like, these are what I would call red, you know, and it might be anything from chiral red to quinacridone or nicolazo gold, you know, and then you're like, okay, I'm going to pick one from this red pile. And then you can pick a yellow and yellow could be anything from, you know, Naples yellow or Titan buff even, you know, in what is a yellow, you know, all the way up to, you know, nickel azo yellow. And then, you know, the blues, those can be purples and teals in there. You know, like you can figure out um, just looking at your colors and more likely than not, if you're like me, you have a hell of a lot more blues and teals than you have reds and yellows. Mm -hmm. you know but it's interesting in just having that laid out as three different triads and just making it a fun game i'm going to paint today i'm going to go into an art journal or i'm going to paint you know a landscape whatever it is pick one from each of those groupings to kind of have that play with yourself and that's kind of what i'm doing in these color studies i'm i'm picking colors to see can i find something that is exciting. And it is. That last one was a challenge to me. And I'm not ever not going to use it again. But now my challenge is like, I really like that Premier's Light Yellow and I like that Azurite Blue. It's just, what does it go with that makes me happy? Yes. And that's the next piece of this that I'm, I'm going to reach back a little bit to what we talked about in the past with the, like the modern mixing set that mm -hmm. Golden sells where they sell, you know, these wonderful colors that all go together and they literally give you, you know, a chart for how to mix from just these few colors that come in the set. They show you how to mix everything. And I always do those kind of exercises so that, you know, that this is with acrylic paint. So I took the modern mixing set, which is the top row and mixed all of these beautiful colors from it. Um, and that's where I start. Then the next place that I go is typically, I have an, another, I'll give you another little mixing worksheet, Donna. This is actually something that I started using in watercolor, but I've now started using it in acrylic as well. And it's just a mixing worksheet, which I'll, I'll put up, but I basically will take a color and I'll explore it. I'll explore its tints, I'll explore its shades, I'll explore its tones, and then I'll take one color and mix it with it in a little bit in different varieties to get a feeling for what that looks like. And so just with one color then, I've got a book and with a page for each color and you know 10 other colors that it goes with right there in my book. And it's so easy for me to refer to that rather than trying to have that mixing memory of, oh, that went with that perfectly. <laughs> you know, Maybe you might put a tab on it for the ones you like best, but let me show you that sheet in general. <laughs> back to the journal I've been working on. I filled one whole journal, but I mean, I honestly go back to this book. If I'm like, I want a green, I, it's become a working reference for my personal life as an artist. And I think that's valuable. Oh, for some reason, this closed. Let me open this up. One second, a little bit of a window Olympics. Here we go, that's the one I want. And let me share it. So this is the mixing worksheet that I use. And I use this for everything. I can't, whether it's pan pastels, watercolors, acrylics, et cetera. And like I said, I s yeah. <laughs> of course I made this. <laughs> because for, for me, it's all about referential. I mean, part of it is also, I'll be a thousand percent honest with you. I get, if I'm stressed out, either if I'm stressed out or if I just am, have a block or if my husband's watching football and I'm expected to watch it with him, <laughs> I'm going to have this out, you know, and I'm just going to be sitting there playing with a color. It's like, oh, touchdown. <laughs> it's just to me it, you learn so much and it's so easy to get past a block if you play with a color like pull out that azurite and just start attacking it 
with 10 other colors and then you've got this reference and it's not for anyone else's eyes it's yours it doesn't have to be neat you know but it, any time spent mixing with these tiny amount of color it's not a waste it's it's a reference that you can stick in a notebook and have forever and ever and ever to refer back to and go oh what was that color i liked you know it's just it, it's I a nice I having a bit of an art gallery. It's just, it really helps you understand a color better. So you take out that one tube and just start playing with it with the whites and the, you know, the grays and then, okay, now I'm gonna pick 10 colors and see what it looks like with those. And then from there, you realize what you really like. Maybe with that, and in this exercise, you're picking out like what could be triad colors, for example, and just play with it. Find those places in the middle, you know, and on either side and see where it goes. But you're gonna learn so much. So, I mean, I know in watercoloring, we tend to do like these gigantic, closing that, you know, these gigantic swatch sheets. And, you know, with this, I'm, I'm just taking that and adding more water or less water, you know, to find out all the things I can do with it. But you know what's right at the bottom? Wheels. So I can sit there and, and mix around with it and figure out what goes together nicely. But there's, it's nothing wrong with spending as much time as you want to doing that. Um, I have the same thing in warm and cool color exercises that I do all the time where I'm mixing the different colors. Yeah, and, but this works with everything. You could be doing this with pan pastels. You could get out, you know, your stabilos and just start playing with them and see how they mix. And, you know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but the time spent, those are references that are invaluable to me. I'm constantly referring to it going, oh, I want that color. If I'm not working, you know, I'm working very specifically on something and I want this color, I know I can just go flip, 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 flip and see it right away, I know what I want. And so that's why I spend a lot of time on it because it saves me so much time when I'm in the heat of it and I just want to get that color. So it's invaluable and it's, it's a time you're investing in your own practice. Did that spark any questions in anybody? I mean, it's a lot of information we give you and I know it's sometimes you need like a day or two to rewatch it even just to digest it. But um, this is really the perfect forum for picking Sally Lynn's brain and, and asking questions about product or triads or even suggestions. I think, you Rosie, I, think I see your hand. Um, yeah, can you, you can hear me, right? I sure can. Um, yes. so, so how much does the paper that you put it on matter? I know in print, you know, as a designer, the kind of white of the paper can make a big difference. It, do you, can you tell me about what kind of paper you make these beautiful rainbow charts on? Well, for this, I tend to use the same thing for watercolor or acrylic, et cetera. And this is not expensive. Um, it's just it's literally this stuff. And nothing expensive to that because I'm not looking for, I oh, don't know, the coverage, but the mixing is there. The water with a high quality watercolor paper, with a decent enough watercolor paper, you can do some good mixing without having it buckle on you. You know, but you, when you're doing stuff, yeah, the Canton XL, I, I love that stuff. It's inexpensive, it's always on sale, and it's thick enough that you can really get, you know, some good work out of that. Um, the same thing with these larger sheets. Um, they're nothing exciting, but they're usually watercolor based because they just hold the paper and hold up to the mixing that I'm doing. Definitely. Which modern theory set should we get? Someone's asking. Um, Golden Open is the one I use just because especially when I'm doing mixing, um, they stay open and I can have it. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. Here's my palette. <laughs> so I've got all the open, the modern set here. They've been in here for eight months. Um, I just have this wonderful covered palette that you just put the lid on. It's not a stay wet or anything, but it's an airtight palette that snaps shut. 
And when I wanna go work with these again, I just missed it with a little bit of water and they're off and running. Um, so I love using Golden Open because unlike a heavy body for this particular practice, um, a heavy body is definitely going to dry up and become plastic. So for myself, um, I tend to use a lot of open and um, it's one of those things, I don't know, down the line, Donna, <laughs> should we be getting into the business of selling tiny little watch tins? Because <laughs> everybody freaks out over this, but this is when I went, had to come travel here in the middle of COVID, we just came down here to our little 1980s heck land of a townhouse. And so I brought like my pallets of, you know, that's all gold and open and they're in watch tins. And the watch tins are like, um, aluminum, which is the same thing that high quality, you know, paint manufacturers have their paints in aluminum tubes. And so these live in here like nobody's business. I have the entire line of golden open paints in a watch tin. <laughs> and they're still as vibrant and perfect as they were the day. I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. And they've been in there for almost a year now. <laughs> so I just, I love it. it not because I'm using it necessarily as an open, but when I want to mix and play and learn, I love using them. Now you can always play there. You can put open medium in your paint, 100%. Don't go out and buy all new. But if you if you have certain colors and you want to do the mixing with them, you can buy this stuff and mix it into your paint so that they have more openness to them. It isn't the same as open, but it'll at least make them stay wet longer so that you don't get frustrated that you've created all this stuff and now you can't even paint it. Mm -hmm. Hope that answered a question, the person who That's typed it. Oh, yay, there's Liz. Hi, Liz. <laughs> all right, come on, people, unmute yourself. We want to hear from you. <laughs> I'll show you, let's see. I've got another one to just show you difference in um, mixing. This is also watercolor. Let me bring it up while you're thinking of your questions. So these are like three different mixing triads with watercolors and you know, it works the same. As you can see on the bottom, you know, I, I chose permanent alizarin Permanent Lizard and Crimson, Fallow Blue Green Shade, and Hansa Yellow Light in that case. Um, and just, you know, gave me a wonderful range of those kind of pure hues. It's just, it's a lot of fun to work with them. Um, and you get totally different looks with just a set of three paints. I think the other really interesting way to think about it is, I, I know in dealing with a lot of my mentees, they're all like really concerned about stylistic and, um, how, you know, how do I find my style? How is my style different? That kind of thing. And I think we all tend to like colors, you know, some like neutral tones, some like earthen, some like jewel, some like bright and happy. And you can kind of figure out the palette based off of your mood, based off of your style by just having these go-to colors. You do not need all the colors. I mean, you do because if you see she who dies with the most product wins. But you do not need to have everything in the bag of tricks, but it is important for you to know what you like. There is no need for you to have the first color wheel there if you know stylistically you like the one below it so much better. Yeah, and that, that's the difference between if you're painting, I mean, it's atmospheric, right? If you're doing a lot of urban stuff, your palette is maybe completely different than mine. Although I have seen, you know, someone do the Chrysler Tower in rainbow colors and it was freaking amazing. <laughs> but th that's about what feel, what atmosphere you're trying to create. And, you know, I suggest if you find a triad you like, hit it with, you know, go after it with totally different subject matter and, you know, do one with florals, do one with urban setting, do one, you know, with whatever and just see, that's how you find your style, the things that scream, yes, this is me, you know, so it isn't about, you know, it, it is just about finding which, you know, playing with those wheels and having something go, gosh, that would look so great in this, you know, subject that I want to paint. And then I also think there's 
<laughs> two other subjects. It's a trio of subject matter. I think it's good too with abstract artists because abstract art is really hard to wrap your head around. It's really hard to execute and feel always confident about. But, you know, I'm looking at this wheel and I'm thinking that second wheel there, you know, the one next to the bright colors, what a great abstract with tone on tone and layers and depth that would be. And so when we start thinking about abstracts, they don't always have to be, you know, the brightest of the bright in order to make an impact. Sometimes those subtle shifts in color are actually the things that make an abstract piece work so much more dynamically, especially like I'm thinking about you, Debbie, because I know you like these earthen colors. And then um, I'm looking at the purples leading into the reds there and just kind of loving how that could take over a whole piece. Yeah, so it really is just about exploring it and and using it three ways, you know, in different subject matters or different ways, you know, different mark making and just feel if it speaks to you, you know, because what speaks to you is going to be completely different than what speaks to me. Say, thank God for that. Right. <laughs> because, you know, yeah, this head is a little weird, but it's just it's it's fun. It's it's freeing especially if you feel weighed down by what's going on, you play with color and you discover something that then you could use for an entire series. And mm -hmm. everything goes, I mean, you've got something that literally you can have a showing with because it all just speaks you. That's, I guess that's the end of the lesson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did, did, we, did we stall long enough for anybody to formulate a question or are we, uh, we closing it up? Trying to make sure I covered everything while they're thinking. Yes. Power forever hold your peace. Well, you know, just in wrapping this up, I will have this probably either later today or tomorrow up on my Patreon, and all of the downloads that Sally Lynn sends me will be um, available just through download through the post that's on there. And um, if you have questions at some point, even as you walk away, or if you're looking at the handouts and you're trying to figure out which way you should move with it, just either leave it in the comments or reach out to Sally Lynn or myself. And um, I'm sure it would probably be a simple explanation to just walk you through. Oh, we have a where do we buy watch tins. I actually have that on my website. And yeah, I agree. The tins and the little holder. Let me just um, look that up really quick. I answered that for someone the other day. And so, uh, let me see if I can find your answer because it's on my website at sallylynnmcdonald.com, but it's not super easy to find because I have not been giving my website a lot of love. So I will find that link for real quick here and give it to you. And I think it's really good for anybody, if, you're, well, if, if you can actually go outside, some of you that are living in California right now, you won't see the outdoors for a long time. It's like 115 degrees there or something. Um, but if you do have, if you do live in an area where there's a breeze and you can actually go outside without humidity, I think those watch tins make it so much more enjoyable to paint and just to kind of be in nature and, you know, you can plain air with them. Because acrylics typically are not easy to plain air with because they dry too quick. Um, so it's a really, it, it, and it's, or just go somewhere that's not your house or your living room, or just sit in your living room space, I guess. All right, I just put a link to the, uh, to the post on my blog that has the link to the watch tins and the pictures. Um, I post it to everyone in the chat. Hopefully you can see that and just click on that real quick and save the bookmark. Well, I want to say thank you again, Sally Lynn. You know, Sally Lynn does this for free every month for us to share um, because she is your biggest advocate for understanding color and getting the most from your investment that you've already done probably in the golden palette and just knowing that you have so much more at your disposal than just um, what you thought you might have had at least I know myself that's literally how she changed my life she turned my paint stash into a gazillion colors in a heartbeat so I want to thank you, Sally Lynn, for always showing up for us and doing the color collab and all the hard work you do to put those things together for us every month. Well, thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. You know how much I, I, I love this community, and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone's work on your group on Facebook and beyond. 
Well, I guess if there's no more questions, we're peace out. Mic drop. All right, guys. See you next time.